I wonder if you've ever been utterly and completely lost. Have you been there? Um, we had a good time once leaving Ikea up in the Gateshead. I don't know what it was. Every time we left Gateshead Ikea, we went the wrong way. And so you start getting nervous about it. And uh, one day, somehow, we ended up having left Ikea thinking that we were going to go the sort of 50 yards or whatever it is onto the A1, um, around a few roundabouts, but we got it wrong. And we ended up in the middle of Newcastle in a one-way street that at the end of which there was just a car park, an NCP car park with a barrier. And uh, we just thought, I don't know how to get out of this. And somehow we turned down into like a service lane and sort of ended up driving in the back of this car park underneath the ground, wondering where on earth uh, we were. Or another time I remember um, as a, a, a teenager going out on a, a night hike, practicing for a Duke of Edinburgh and uh, walking in the dark and walking through the woods where the, the path that we were on just disappeared. All the trees had been chopped down and you just couldn't see where you were and literally thinking, we have not got a clue where we are. We've got this massive wood. And uh, fortunately, we saw a light and we went and knocked on the door and they were able to tell us uh, where, we, where we were. Or, or, or perhaps it's not so much a physical being lost, but more of a, like a uh, just not knowing which way to turn sort of being lost in life type of thing, uh, coming to a decision where you just don't know which way to turn, the left or to the right. Or, or perhaps, to put it another way, and perhaps even closer to what we're finding in the Scriptures here, whether you found yourself in a place of danger. Um, again, either physical or spiritual or emotional sort of danger. You've gone uh, and you're in a situation in life where um, you're concerned uh, Am I going to be safe? And, and I, this is, these are the sort of things that we're going to be thinking about as we consider what's going on here in uh, Matthew chapter 2. And you see, if you're not a Christian, at a time like those, really, it's down to you, isn't it? Re really, you're just trying to make the best with your own human wisdom and perhaps with other human help. But the great blessing of being a Christian is that in those situations, we hopefully remember that we have a heavenly father who knows all things, a, a father we can look to, not just when we're in need, but certainly when we are in need, we have a heavenly father that we can reach out and grab his hand. And again, that's what we're going to be thinking about this morning, a heavenly father who looks after his children. And so we're at the end of a series, the, the fifth one of a series of looking at the real angels of Christmas. We looked at the angel that appeared to Zechariah right at the beginning, announcing the birth of John the Baptist to, to Zechariah and to um, Elizabeth. We've thought about the angel appearing to Mary and telling her that she was going to be with child. Uh, we've thought about the angel appearing to Joseph when he was thinking of divorcing um, uh, before they'd even got married. Um, uh, because of what had gone on, he wanted quietly to... Uh, to do that but the angel affirmed to him that what, what was happening was a, a gift of God and that he should uh, not do that and then uh, we thought about the appearance of the angel and then the angels um, yesterday to the shepherds shouting and declaring glory to God and peace uh, to men today we turn to Joseph again we go back to Joseph because it's the angels that, uh, it's to Joseph that the angels appear in this passage, and um, we're gonna we're gonna uh, focus in. There's a there's a couple of uh, moments. Firstly, in verse thirteen, uh, now when the, uh, they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So an angel's appearing to him in a dream and telling him there's danger. Herod's out to kill the children. In fact, he's out to kill Jesus, and he'll kill anybody um, who gets in the way of that. So he wants to kill anybody that's um, under two years old. He's certain that that will cover the, the age. Um, by now, Jesus, we don't know how old he is, uh, but he's certainly, I guess, more than just a, a day or two old. Um, probably weeks, probably months, uh, perhaps even anything up to two years. But knowing Herod and how horrible he was, I suspect that it wasn't that he looked back and said, oh, they said that it was two years ago that they set off. 
You remember it was to do with the, the time that the uh, star had appeared to these wise men. Um, and that, I, I, I suspect that it was a matter of months before, and he was just making sure by killing anybody up to two years old. He, he was a, a horrible guy, and he was determined that this um, baby that he considered as a threat had been called the king of the Jews should be killed. And so the angel um, reveals uh, this to Joseph, that he needs to get up and get out from Herod and go to Egypt. And then uh, later on in verse 19, again, an angel appears in a dream, tells Joseph that Herod is now dead. You don't need to be in Egypt anymore. Uh, time to come back to Israel. And then we find later on, we don't know if it's an angel, but just it, um, it, was, it just says he was warned in a dream in verse 22. When he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there and being warned in a dream, perhaps by an angel, perhaps just in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So he'd gone back to um, Israel, but decided to keep out of Judea and go up north. Um, to Galilee and to Nazareth. So these are the, the three um, occasions, certainly the first two and possibly the third one. All messages from God to Joseph when he was in a spot, in a place of danger. And like all of the other um, appearances of the angels, we must say, of course, that, that uh, these are very specific. There are appearances of angels, there's a specific thing going on, and we can't just automatically apply everything that we read to ourselves. But there's certainly something general that we can see here about God caring for his son that we can consider because, of course, if we're Christians, then we've trusted in Jesus and we become adopted into God's family as his children. And I think you'll find it's a message of great comfort. So what, what, what do we learn? I want to say firstly that God cares. God cares. And, and just, just thinking about what God was doing, God the Father was doing as he saw all this. He, he cares enough about Mary and Joseph and Jesus to send an angel to warn Joseph that Herod wants to destroy uh, Jesus. In, in fact, the wise men also, we don't know if it was an angel, but they were warned in a dream as well in verse 12. Being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed uh, to their own country by another way. You remember that uh, Herod had told them, when you find, go and search for him, he's going to be in Bethlehem area. When you find him, I want to worship him too. Ha, ha, ha. And so come back and tell me. And they were warned in a dream not to do that and went back um, by a different route. And no doubt, well, they did upset. Um, he was furious because they'd done that. And you might say, well, it's, it's understandable. You know, we're thinking here, Robin, about, you know, God and his son, the son of God. Um, of course he cares uh, for his son. And of course he cares for their earthly parents. But does God not say that we're part of his family? Does God not call us his children, his, his sons and his daughters? Remember why Jesus came in the first place. He came to save his people from their sins. He came to save you and I. God sent his son for us. So of course he cares for us too. Yes, he cares for Jesus. And, and yes, Jesus had a mission. But he cares for us. And in a human sense, Jesus was very vulnerable. A, a, a a small baby, a young child. He, he was vulnerable. He needed his parents. He, he needed to be, get away from this danger. And the father steps in. No doubt. He could have completely wiped terror out, couldn't he? Uh, but he chose rather to remove his son from the dangerous situation. I wonder if you're in a dangerous spot right now. Perhaps you're in the middle of a full-on spiritual battle. Perhaps there's a, really is literally a battle for your soul. Perhaps you're in a position where you're not sure whether you're going to trust in Christ and follow him, or you're in a situation where actually you're going to turn away from him. That's a dangerous place to be. The Lord wants us to turn to him and to be saved and to follow and walk 
in his ways. Or perhaps you're, you're a Christian, but there is some great spiritual battle going on in your life. There's some uh, area of danger that you're walking into spiritually. Perhaps there's um, evil, um, there's, there's persecution. You're finding it hard. People are getting at you and saying things and doing things uh, 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 that, that's against you because you're a Christian. Perhaps it's, it's not that. Perhaps it's a, an anxiety or a fear that's crippling you. Perhaps uh, there's um, threats that you perceive for the future. Perhaps even the COVID situation itself, you feel like it's hunting you down. It's been a difficult year, two years, isn't it? With those sort of thoughts constantly and constant changes of rules. And, and that feeling of being in a place of danger hasn't been far from us all. Or, or perhaps, perhaps this place of danger is completely self-inflicted. Perhaps you've deliberately danced with sin and danced with temptation. Perhaps you've drifted away from fellowship with God's people or drifted away from God, not spending time with him and his word, not being with his people. These are, these are dangerous places to be for a Christian. And, and if you're a Christian, you need to remember that you are a child of God and you can be sure that he cares for you. You are like a brother or sister to Jesus. And just as God showed his care for his son, the Lord Jesus, while he was on earth, he wants to show his care uh, for you today. Your heavenly father knows that you need help. And he will give you all that you need. Just look to him and ask. If you're not a Christian then there is no promise of God's protection, I'm afraid. But he does care about you. And so turn to him for help. Don't turn to him like a genie, like you just rub a magic lamp and get your wishes. But turn to him as Lord, the one who's master that you're willing to follow. No one, the scriptures say, are going to turn to God and find that he pushes them away. They'll all be welcomed so turn to him he's ready to help what a comfort it is today to know that God cares secondly God leads he doesn't just stop at God caring he wants to direct us away from trouble he or from danger he doesn't just send an angel to warn Joseph that the message isn't just Joseph there's a terrible crisis, you, you need to do something. He tells him what to do. He, he says you need to go um, to Egypt. A and through the passage, we get that continually. That Jesus, that Joseph is sent away, uh, uh, away to uh, Egypt and then from Egypt back to Israel. And then when he's in Israel, told uh, specifically where to go to be safe. He doesn't just deliver the family from the threat of Herod. He continues to guide and lead them. I wonder what direction that you, uh, what help with direction you need right now. I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be something, some area of your life, uh, something that you need to make a decision on, some uh, direction you need to take the family, uh, some change that you need to be thinking about some change that needs to happen where we should live where we should work how to invest our, uh, um, our time what we should spend our money on where to direct our giving where to sow seeds of the gospel and, and you, i'm sure you can think of many more things that you need guidance on things that you need help with Now, God cares about all these things. And he wants to lead you and he wants to guide you. And, and so just the encouragement I want to bring this morning is ask him. And listen to him. What comfort again. Not just that God cares, that, like he, 
he wants to alert you that you're in danger, but he wants to guide you and be with you uh, continually. But again, let me just say that we can't live a Christian life until we've come to him initially and surrendered ourselves. So if you're not a Christian, the first thing to do is not just try and find guidance in specific situations, but you need to come to him as Lord and as Saviour and put your trust and faith in him. Being born again, the scriptures say. So he cares, he leads, and the last thing I want to think about is that he knows. And of all the things that we're going to think about, this is the one that I find the most comforting. I don't know what you make of it, but he cares, he leads, and of course they're comforting too, but he knows. I don't just mean that he knows about your situation. I, I do mean that, and I guess that's sort of implied in, in caring and leading. But I want to specifically say that he knows the future. And that, so as God is showing his care, and as God leads, and, he, and as he guides you through the challenges ahead, you can be sure that he knows where this all leads. And he proves it in this chapter. Three times it tells us this was to fulfill what the prophets hundreds of years before had said. So if you look at verse um, uh, 15, God knew that his son would be called out of Egypt. Uh, and that's a quote from Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1. It's talking there about the son being Israel and being delivered from persecution under Pharaoh in Egypt. And clearly the implication is that, the, uh, that we should understand that as a prophecy, uh, and in fact a, a type of Jesus being called from Egypt back to um, Nazareth eventually. Or look down at verses 17 and 18, where we read that God knew that young children in Bethlehem and the surrounding region would be killed. He knew this murderous uh, guy, Herod, when, what, what he was going to do. And, and, and it says, verse 17, this was, thus was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. The quote is from Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 15. And it speaks as if Rachel is still alive at that point, which she isn't. And uh, is mourning the loss of her children. It's talking about the exile of God's people, both the northern kingdom and later the southern kingdom. That, that she was mourning the loss of her children in, in exile. And again, we, I think we should read into what's being said here, that this is, a, is, is typifying the exile of Jesus to uh, Egypt and the great loss of life at Herod's um, hands. And then at the end of verse 23, we're told that God knew that his son Jesus would be called a Nazarene. He was going to grow up in Nazareth. It's an interesting one if you're interested in, in searching out and thinking about prophecies. It's an interesting one because there is no reference in the Old Testament to, G to Jesus or the Messiah being a, a Nazarene or coming from Nazareth. And, and so there's a bit of a debate about what this is talking about. Is it some prophecy that they knew of that we don't know? I think what she's, what's the most likely, having read a little bit about it, is that there's a few hints. It, interestingly, it says, by the prophets. It's the only time that it actually talks about more than one. And, and it seems, I think, to be referring to the way that Nazareth was regarded as a bit of a despised uh, place. You know, it was, it was a place where the southerners would look and say, well, they're, they're sort of heathen northerners up there. They're rough sort of folk. Uh, you might have felt on the end of this, and sorry for being a southerner in all this, but you, you, you get that, that feeling the Nazareth, you know, was it um, John, isn't it? Uh, I've got it here. John 1, 46. Well, does anything good uh, come from Nazareth? You know, you can, you can imagine someone saying, Loftus, does, any, does anything good come from Loftus? It's, sort of, it's that sort of reputation that the place had. 
And then it's interesting, if you think, if this, if this is what it means, that you can think of some of the prophecies that speak about the Messiah being despised. Well, one of them is in uh, Psalm 22. Verses 6 to 8. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let, the Lord, uh, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. And then perhaps you, you might have already thought, um, those of you that are familiar with Isaiah 53, some verses here, verses 2 and 3 in particular. Isaiah 53, it says, For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should despise, uh, desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one with whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. And that seems to make sense. That's the thought about um, Jesus being called a Nazarene. It was just like a term of, of, of derision. Jesus, ha, from, from Nazareth. Ha, what, sort of, what sort of person or great person is going to come from Nazareth? And all, all three of these prophecies remind us that God's in control. Reminds us that God knows the future. The king's... Herod and anybody else can stand against God and seek to kill him, but it's God's purposes that will prevail. And so what an encouragement for us. And I say, I, I really felt uh, that this encouragement, particularly um, during these last two years. What an encouragement it is to know that God is in control. That he knows the future. That yes, he cares, and yes, he leads, but he also knows where it's going. And I've certainly appreciated this sort of thought more than ever before. So, so God knows what 2022 will bring. So some think that the public health crisis will pass and we'll all get back to normal. Some think that this crisis is all... Mm, much more sinister and that we're heading into a time of greater authoritarianism and tyrannical governments so I really don't know but the Lord does now you might have an opinion on that but what brings peace and comfort to me is that God knows and the future is in his hands and that he will care and lead us through the coming days whatever they hold and so, just as God cares for and protects Jesus, he cares for us. And just as God led Joseph and Mary and Jesus, he will lead us. And just as God knew the future for Jesus, he knows our future too. And in a way, we're just carrying on from those of you that were here yesterday. I, I, uh, I, I suggested that one thing that we should do is RIP, rest in peace. And uh, I know we don't normally use it to, in this sort of way. We're normally talking about someone that's dead. But there's a real sense, we talked yesterday specifically about peace, but there's a real sense in which as we reflect on God's care for his son on earth and think about his care for us, we really truly can rest in peace. Not that that doesn't mean there's not stuff to do. Don't get the impression by resting in peace it means there's nothing to do and you're just going to laze around on the sofa. There's stuff to do. But in our spirits, we can rest in peace that God is in control, that he does care and he will lead us. He'll show us the way. And that doesn't just apply to COVID-19 and national and international issues. It applies to every single little part of your life. The Lord knows. He sees and he plans and he looks ahead. He is sovereign. That's what it means. He's sovereign. He's in charge. He reigns. And when we think like this, when we get, sort of get our heads straight and our perspectives straight, it shows up how stupid we often are in the way that we stress and we strain, 
the way that we try and work everything out in our own strength, the way that we carry the burdens of the world upon our shoulders. And God's not made us to do that. He does that. We just need to ask him about what we need to do for today. So I just want to encourage you this morning to look to your heavenly father. He will take care of you. He will guide you. He will protect you because he knows what's ahead. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the great blessing that there is in, in knowing you as our heavenly father. Thank you that you know how to give good gifts to your children. We thank you that you, you know how to care for us, that you know the right way for us, that, Lord, you know what's ahead. You have a plan and a purpose ahead. And, Lord, uh, we just thank you that um, we, we, we don't want to know all the details because perhaps it would scare us, perhaps it would make us uh, anxious. Thank you, Lord, that you just help us each day. And please teach us what it is to rest in you during these challenging days. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.